this second round of thesis lectures. Um, we have a really fantastic show in the gallery. I'm really excited to see what the students have to say um, about the work today. Thank you all for accommodating the change. You know, we, we had to do this on the Sunday on Mother's Day. I, I appreciate it, especially all you moms that came out. Um, but hopefully it's a really cool way for everybody to, to acknowledge the accomplishment. You know, you guys have gone through a really rigorous year. Um, you've worked super hard, and hopefully this is a really cool way to share something with your kids um, that they've worked really hard to, to achieve. So, we're going to have Christian Hessler go first, followed by Zach Cole, Carson, Carson, didn't know, like Carson Sears, and Sophia Carlson. So, uh, the first three people will be talking, and then Sophia, in keeping with her work, will be um, presenting you some video. So, uh, without further ado, Christian Hessler. over this last year, and what a journey this has been. For my project, I have used glass and light to showcase my themes of communication and network, titled Exulances. Exulances is the tendency to give up trying to talk about a, an experience because people are unable to relate to or understand, this, understand it. This tendency allows the memory to drift away until the memory itself feels out of place. I decided to name my work Exilances because all my life I have been told by my friends and family that I talk in code or that what I'm saying just doesn't make sense. My thoughts tend to jump from thing to thing, making seemingly random connections, which in my experience can cause confusion for others if they don't know what that connection is. Sometimes I will try to describe that connection and other times not, which is why this concept of Exilances is such a powerful concept for me. And before I show my work to you all today, I would first like to explain to you how I got to where I am. When I first started coming up with ideas for my senior thesis last year, I started, up, uh, started with this concept of the imposition of belief. Focusing on how memories were formed in childhood and how even small things can imprint on us and change the way we perceive our world. I came up with designs like this, but after a lot of thought about my work, I thought it was just too literal. So I decided to pivot my thoughts to a different concept, trauma. I began working and designing a body of work to showcase trauma that I had experienced in a way to tell my story. As I was carefully designing the perfect way to incorporate all the trauma I had experienced in my life, I took a step back and looked at my design. It literally told anyone who looked at my work exactly my story. It left no, thought, no room for second thoughts or opinions. In short, it was again very literal. I pivoted my ideas once again, and I later realized that this concept of trauma would be the catalyst to working more uh, abstractly. I began thinking about new concepts, and I landed in talking about communication and network. After having thought about memories for so long, I figured I would talk about them and how they communicated, which, on, which brought on my newest thought about making abstract neuron, or about making anatomically correct glass neurons. Surely this would be what I'm looking for. So I tried it. I made, albeit a broken version of it, a glass neuron. But after having made this, I still didn't think my work was there yet. It, was still, was, it still was in a very literal way of telling you about communication. I decided to pivot my, I, my designs once again. I thought about what it meant to work more abstractly, mixing in my previous ideas of the imposition of belief, trauma, and communication. I began thinking about what it meant to work more abstractly. The answer I came up with was creating art that doesn't tell you how to think or feel, but instead letting the audience come up with their own meanings for the work and letting them decide how they want to think and feel. Art doesn't have to be the same meaning for everyone. In fact, I very much want everyone to have their own experience and to have their own meanings for the work. So instead, I dived into the process and let the form create itself basing it off my intuition in the moment with a general idea of what I needed. I wanted something that would be able to hang, something that was organic in the way it moved, hollow in order to hold light, and I wanted one more thing. As many of these forms 
that I can make in the time I was allotted. As the process unfolded, a form began to take shape, and I knew then that this would be exactly what I needed. After having completed my first form, I wanted to see if there was any other alterations I could make. In order to better bring about my concepts, I revisited some artists I follow and looked to see what they are doing and to see how I might be able to adapt some of their styles into my work. A contemporary Japanese artist who I think does a wonderful job of creating powerful, immersive experiences is Yoyoi Kusama. She is a Japanese installation artist who talks about mental health. She uses large scale and repeated forms along with light. Her work definitely has a sense of awe and really focuses on expressing her mental health issues. I find her work to be something that I can identify with as she really focuses on expressing her, her issues. Um, her work has helped me to imagine how I can work through some of my own issues and how I can turn those issues into art. Next is Swedish artist Pippa Loti Risk. She is an artist who is most often known for her experimental video art and her installation art. She is commonly, commonly associated with feminist art, but I often find inspiration from her overlapping imagery. She uses such bright and bold colors and pairs sound with light. I find this pairing to be quite interesting because it, it helps become a more interactive environment for the viewer. The way she can transform a space is something I identify with and I am trying to attempt myself. Another artist is, that I turn to for inspiration is Taylor Hickey. She is an artist who primarily works in printmaking and in sculptures. She focuses on making art that pays homage to the human endeavor and to understanding the universe at large. Some of her sculptures uh, are minimalistic, but uses the form to better showcase the light inside. The way Hickey uses the surface texture of the form to allow only certain patterns of light uh, through has inspired me to pay, uh, pay better attention to the surface texture of the glass that I am using. I invested a significant amount of time playing with and changing the form. Trying to adapt Hickey's style by manipulating how light shines through, I conducted an, an, experiment, an experiment and sandblasted my work. By manipulating how the light shines through, um, I thought that maybe making this sandblasted texture um, being translucent throughout my form would help change the experience my viewer had. Um, although it illuminated the form more evenly, it changed the view of the optic fiber cables on the inside. Instead of seeing them individually, I now only saw the bundles of cable. It wasn't what I wanted. I tried other experiments. One of those that I conducted was incorporating sound into my work. Much like how Wrist incorporates sound into her work, my goal was to let the audience control the activity of light, of light in the work. I attempted to create a program that would listen to the level of sound in the room and change the brightness level accordingly. My hope was that the audience members would be able to yell, whisper, talk, or make any sort of loud sounds and the piece would visually respond to it. As I worked to achieve this goal with my computer science professors, I began making this program. Though I created many different iterations of this program, None of them were able to connect to my work. Although I may not have this for this body of work, this idea is something that I'm still interested in and will continue to pursue in the future. By this time, I needed to get a better understanding of what my work would look like in the final installation. I had a mental picture of what I wanted, but I still needed my proof of concept. I decided to install my work in my studio and figure out all the equipment I would need and exactly how I wanted to present my work. Once I had developed a clear understanding of what was necessary, I entered the production phase of my, of my project. For this process, I began in the hot shop. I created spheres with small plateaus on the outside and winding and organic tubes, or arms as I like to call them. These forms needed to have a certain thickness in order to properly support their own weight and be able to be hung without breaking. Once these forms were created, I would take them into the cold shop and I would grind the small plateaus of the spheres and the ends of the arms in order to adhere the ends together. I would drill small holes in the center of the plateaus so that the optic fiber could pass through the sphere and into the arms of the piece. And finally, when I was done with the grinding and drilling, I began my adhesion process. 
I used a specific ultraviolet blue meant for glass-to-glass -glass adhesion. This UV blue, once applied to the glass and under ultraviolet light, would dry within 60 seconds, leaving a strong connection that would be able to support its own weight. After the production phase of my work, I entered into the final installation. And installing this work for the show was a labor of love. I spent the entire week of my lot of installation time hanging all the forms and threading all of the optic fiber cables individually for each form. And I know it sounds easy when it's put like that, but it was a huge effort in order to actually do it. Here is an image of my final installation, Exilances. This work is the embodiment of the concept of Exilances. Remember, this refers to the tendency to give up trying to talk about an experience because people are people are unable to relate to or understand it. This tendency allows the memory to drift away until the memory itself feels out of place. With 17 glass sculptures and 1,000 cables of optic fiber, I was able to provide this immersive experience, designed so that people can walk through it and be engulfed by the surrounding work. Each of these sculptures were created uniquely and designed purely based on intuition. The network they form symbolizes the networks that surround us, from traffic lights to banking systems to neurons. Almost everything around us is part of a network. My project is a smaller and easier uh, network to comprehend, giving it its tangibility and scale. By creating a visual means of communication, my, work, my network allows viewers to participate in more open dialogue, analyzing what constitutes communication. Through the simplicity and clarity of communication rendered in light, the work remains able to communicate just as effectively as we do. In fact, it can be quite beautiful. For me, this body of work has many different intentions attached to it, and I believe that depending on how viewers experience the piece, they will be able to, be able to glean at least some of the intentions I have viewed within this installation. First, to create a sense of wonder. Second, to create an interconnected network that can be shown communicating. And lastly, to allow others the opportunity to describe the work for themselves. For my first intention, to create a sense of wonder for the viewer, I wanted viewers to be able to interact and engage in this immersive experience. To do this, I thought primarily about the presentation of the work. Making conscious decisions about the height of each sculpture, the exact location relative to other nearby sculptures, and the path the optic fiber cables take. By hanging each sculpture where they are now, I create a natural path for the viewer to walk through and look at each individual sculpture. This allows the viewer to walk, or this allows the viewer to pay closer attention uh, and look more in depth at all of these subtle details in the work. By paying close attention to the path of the optic fibers, I have noticed something interesting happen. The path these cables take spread apart and come together in various parts, like a line drawn in space. These paths the cables take not only connect all my work together, but in and of themselves they create a, create a sense of wonder. With the way they light up random, randomly and the way they cast reflections, create a never-ending loop of visual stimulation. My second primary intention was to create an interconnected network that can be shown communicating through a visual means. This intention for me was a way to begin a dialogue about how we communicate and how we put, how much power we put on external sources, and how they have a way, uh, how, and how they have a uh, ability to change the way we communicate. This intention for me was a way to begin that dialogue about how we communicate and the power they have. The center of this installation, where all the cables connect, become a focal point of the work, being the brightest point. It adds an extra layer of emphasis on the external source. It becomes apparent that this center, this external source right behind the light, is controlling the visual communication. You'll notice when looking at the piece in the gallery, the light seems to be constantly changing, as if responding. This constant change of light from external source demonstrates how any outside information can influence a network response and change how they communicate. By adding this extra emphasis and letting the viewer focus on this external source, you can visually see that the power that this source has and how it spreads out to control the communication throughout the network. 
There's a certain amount of power we place on outside sources, whether it's from imprinting at a young age or through the constant intake of information. By making this source the center and showing communication impacted by this external source, my key concepts of communication and network stand out. My final intention is for people to try and describe this piece to others who have never seen it. By making an immersive experience as intricate as this one, it becomes difficult to accurately describe it so that others can understand. By allowing others to try and describe it, they will either successfully describe it so that others understand it, strengthening their own memory of this piece, or they won't be able to accurately describe it and give up trying to talk about their experience, which allows the viewer to experience exulances for themselves. As I look back on this journey of creating my first body of work, I've realized a few things. That I don't need to tell you exactly how to think and feel in order to make successful art. I can use intuition to create more abstract work that allows you to think for yourself. I have learned that it is important to look at fellow artists, past and present, and see how they go about facing some of those obstacles that you are currently going through. It can lead to some wonderful experiments. And finally, the presentation of the work is not an afterthought. It is a meticulously it is a meticulous and well thought out, thought out process that guides the viewer in how to navigate the space and the intended experience. It is difficult to say where my future work may go, but as I continue to create more work, I plan to be more mindful of these lessons and try to incorporate them into my studio practice. Thank you. questions now if anyone has any questions. Hello? Um, so can you describe the process of like deciding what color to go with and why you ended up on this color specifically? Yeah. Um, so I have this book. Uh, it's called The Color Bible. And it has a, a wide range of colors and their uh, explicit meanings. I kind of wanted something that was calm yet full of um, energy. So I went with something called an electric blue. Right? Um, this color was, by that very definition, uh, calming but full of energy. And when I put it on this piece, it just wasn't quite right. It was close, but not there yet. So I uh, continued just to tweak the color ever so slightly, and I would just sit with that color and think about how this made me feel. And after about a week of figuring out which color I wanted, I landed with this um, slightly offset electric blue. Uh, you said that I guess you felt a large part of your design was driven on intuition. Uh, were there certain parts that you felt that you had uh, higher amounts of intuition where things would happen faster? I'd be interested in knowing what those were. Yeah, so um, there's primarily um, one area that I felt like I had a, a huge amount of intuition placed into it, um, and that was creating the arm of the piece. Um, I wanted them each to be very unique, and I wanted them to be organic and winding. So this process of creating an arm takes about five minutes, so it's a very quick process of creating each arm. Um, so I have about one heat, um, which is about 30 seconds in order to manipulate the arm to the exact final position. So it's a process of turning and kind of flinging my arm around, trying to get this glass to, to land in the, in the area I want. Um, and if I can't make it in that 30 seconds, um, you know, whether it's winding or whether it's reaching out, um, it just doesn't work. Um, so placing a lot, of, a lot of amount of intuition into that step is kind of where I felt like I found most of this diversity. Cool. Awesome. Thank you again for coming out. Um, now for Zach Cole. Senior thesis art lecture. My name is Zach Holt. I was born in Wichita, Kansas, the air capital of the world. This title comes from the numerous aircraft companies that were either founded or headquartered in Wichita. These companies are Stearman, Cessna, Beach, Boeing, Learjet, Hawker, and Spirit. McConnell Air Force Base also calls Wichita home. So you can imagine all sorts of planes flying over all, all the time. 
Every year, Boeing would put on an event called the Boeing Family Days, where all the employees of the Wichita plant would bring their families to see where they worked, along with all the planes that came out of Wichita. I remember going to what was called the Bunny Wash, where the planes would get a bath before being sent on their way. The CEO of the Wichita plant would be there passing out hot dogs to each member in their family. I remember him telling my dad, thank you for all the work you do for us. Being little, I thought he was just saying that to my dad, and I was so excited my dad was so important. I didn't realize he said it to everyone as they passed by. But the best part of family days for me was the McConnell Air Force Base had their annual air show the very same day. They would load us up on a bus and transport us to to the tarmac of one of the Boeing runways. We got front row seats to the air show and the plane the military used in combat. My first ever scene of the B-1 bomber was at Boeing Family Days. I was also allowed to walk through a C-5 transport plane, which inspired a lot of my work and see inside its cockpit. We also got to see the Blue Angels do their stunt and many other planes fly over, including all the military planes, the recognizable retired Dock B-29 and then planes throughout the ages, such as single wing, five wings, and stagger wings, and I knew I wanted to ride them all. The aviation business in the city of Wichita has had a huge impact on my family's past and present. Working from right to left, my dad is currently a software engineer working for Boeing. My two uncles both have ties to the aviation industry. One works for Textron Aviation as a mechanical engineer, my other uncle was also a mechanical engineer and a lead inspector at Boeing. He and my dad worked on two different projects together. My dad developed a retru drawing retrieval solution for Air Force One. And my uncle was the lead inspector on it. He was responsible for communicating with the FFA on airworthiness. Later, he worked on the Boeing 747 Airborne Laser Project. He also worked on an automated parts finishing system together. My grandfather, who worked worked as the lead chemist for Beechcraft. The history of aviation extends into my mother's side of the family. My great-great-uncle worked for Bo Bell and Boeing helicopters in Texas and Arizona. My great-great-aunt was one of the original Rosa the Riveters and also worked for Douglas Aircraft in California. All of these family histories and ties to the aviation has made me want to continue my family line of being involved in aviation and aeronautics and show it in my artwork. I have had many flights in both the, in both the commercial planes and a single, small single rotary plane. The rides were different in feel, in feel and exposed on how the wind could affect the flight. I was intrigued on how much difference there were. When designing my pieces, I struggled with how to make a piece recognizable to the audience of what it was, but also make it artistic. The functionality of my piece, both the functionality. The functionality of my piece utilizes both the engineering standpoint and the artisan touch. The building of an airplane wing would cause it, to cause it to turn into a replica scale model, for example. Formally, my work emphasizes deconstructing the major components of an airplane, turning them into a standalone art piece. When all the pieces are shown together, you recognize the components instead of a bunch of spare parts. In the past and present airports located in Wichita, there are two different takes from the perspective of flight, which I've called the artist versus the engineer. The older one is called Magic Flight, which was created by the Mexican sculptor Leonardo Neiman. has softer lines drawing the viewer's attention to the abstract of a jet viewed at 360 degrees. The newer piece, called the Loft, utilizes more of the structural and systematic theme to bring focus into the form of a wing. Both were given premier location, welcoming visitors into Wichita. Because of these two pieces, finding a balance of stationary and movement gave me the cause to look for an artist that sees the beauty of air and space. My major influence for my work is the work of Alexander Calder. Alexander Calder studied mechanical engineer, engineering. Alexander Calder grew up in, the arti in an artistic family. His father called him the garbage man for all the pebbles, strings, and odd bits he keep in his pocket. His early pieces were mobiles of different kinds, earning him the title of the inventor of the mobile. His later, piece, later pieces are what I'm most inspired by, these large, non-moving pieces called stay heels. Like myself, Calder never wanted to be defined by a particular artist movement. 
A lot of my work is made out of a lot of my work is made out of wood and or aluminum. I have elected to use these two materials from the past and present in my construction. Aircraft structures from the past are constructed mostly of wood. Current aircraft are mostly made out of aluminum and other alloys. I have also used manufacturing methods used today, such as rivets, screws, and bombings of different glue. Loft is an artwork made in 2018, which I constructed by using a laser cutting based off an F-14. Loft stands for line-oriented flight training, which is the basis for this piece. Loft has functional moving wings just like the F-14 that extends out to increase drag. Loft was my first piece inspired by aviation. Blade is an artwork that was created in the fall of 2020. 2020 was a piece created to represent the turning propeller of an early airplane. This, this is accomplished by the viewer moving around the piece. As the person moves around, it starts to vanish into one form. Using wood and bent aluminum to create the blade, there are 40 segments in all, 20 wood and 20 metal. These pieces are placed in a pattern alternating between the wood and the metal. As the viewer walks around it, the perspective of the propeller starts to spin. Motor is a piece that I also made in the fall of 2020, which is inspired by a radial engine. It has seven flutes around a center hexagon. Radial engines are used more with planes than have propellers. As you can see each cylinder when looking at the plane. This, this design is based off an older airplane that has an internal combustion engine. The construction of loft, blade, and motor were the foundation of my artwork for my thesis project today. I wanted to stay with the aviation motif while exploring more, more components of aircraft. Glide is a major art piece that I made this year. It is 14 feet long structure inspired by the main wing of a Boeing 787. The 787 is recognized, recognized by its unique wings that sweep upward when sitting still or just taking off into an airfoil shape. If one lightly presses or taps, taps the piece, it will flex as does a wing during takeoff. Glide is a piece of art that those who are not experienced in the structure components of an airplane wing can see the definition of integrity and strength found within. As, as with a real wing, glide gets narrower as it gets to the end. Not only does this add depth, but it gives real per perspective on the precision of the pieces fitting together per imperfectly to form a proper shape. Rotor is another one of my pieces I made this year. It is based upon a turbine engine that has 20 wood, 20 wooden fan blades with a black simmer cone. One of these blades is a different color, symbolizing the spiral of the center cone. This piece, this piece is inspired again by the huge engine of the Boeing 77. The turbine engine is more commonly known as a jet engine and has no propellers or outer moving parts. Sustain is a piece that's based, based on the horizontal stabilizer. One can see what inspired me if you look at the tail of the plane. It may not look too important, but the horizontal stabilizer is one of the most important pieces of the plane. It is what keeps it up in the air and flying straight. I wanted to keep the airfoil design with the slats, but also wanted each slat with an, to have an inner core of air. I believe this space added to the value in the form of this piece. The shadow made by this piece adds definition and size to the piece. Shear is a piece inspired by the vertical stabilizer. On, on an airplane, it is the piece that keeps the nose going left, from going left and, left and right. The vertical stabilizer is also found on the tail of the plane. The, the pieces of shear were made by the same process of using a computer neural control machine. I want to thank Jason from Hastings Cabins who took me in and showed me how to run the machines. This piece shows my skill as an artist and how advanced in woodworking and engineering can mesh together. Sure, it could have been made as part of sustain, but I wanted Sure to stand on its own and be recognized. As I was preparing this show, I struggled with the thought that viewers would see my presentation as a collection of used airport airplane components. After receiving suggestions of hanging, rotor, and glide to add definition, it proves that an artisan impression can encompass engineering and art in an expedition. <coughs> I believe all my pieces fit in with my goal of representing Wichita and my family. I've enjoyed making these pieces from the 
idea in my head to the aim of life. I am proud of my aircraft heritage from my great great aunt, who was one of the original Rose of the Riveters, to my dad, who helped design computer programs for the newest plane. I could be no prouder when I could be no prouder. I take pride every time I see the President of the United States step off Air Force One, knowing that my uncle and dad worked on the same plane to, get it, to help it get it off the ground. I hope my hard work shows enthusiasm and support for my family and the aircraft industry. I, am, I hope it inspired a new generation on how to, to look on how pieces fit together, not only in a mechanical way, but how even an airplane can be a piece of art. I would like to thank everyone who helped me to get to this point, from my friends staying up all night with me, to my family and professors giving me helpful insight. I can't wait for more opportunities as I continue to improve my skills as an artist. Thank you. So at this time, we will take, uh, I will be taking questions. Uh, focus, I guess, visually on the outside. Uh, wondered why not pieces on the inside. I guess the rotor blades could be considered inside, but just the way you uh, see things from that show you went to, or just, just so, um, yeah, a lot of my pieces focus on the outside of the plane. Um, that I would love to continue making more components of aircraft, um, the front nose, the fuselage, just like the inside skeleton, um, maybe the internal instrument display. So I just want to keep making airplane parts. Cool. Printer. Do you guys dream about art when you're running? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> chose to keep, I didn't, I used tongue oil, which is a varnish more than a type of stain, so it doesn't naturally, it's not like an oil, it gets into the wood. I wanted to keep uh, the wood a natural color because that's, I thought, I thought that was more of like paying homage to the past, past aircraft being like fair wood, and then transferring the more into aluminum. What home would you like to see these pieces end up in? I mean, what where would you like them to be? Um, I, I'd love to like put them in like a museum in Wichita. I don't know if that's like a thing that actually happens, but I, I would also love to see this this these pieces travel, where they're like a traveling art show, and based on why it was in, I'd love to just see them like travel everywhere. So I don't know if like a certain home would be. Do you think you ever reach a point where you make work about flight itself versus specific components of flight? Thinking more about like going to use these birds in space or something? Right. Um, I definitely think I could tie in flight more to, into my artwork, but I want to, right now, I want to keep the airplane components, but I still think I can not get rid of the airplane components of the artwork, but just add more flight to the airplane components. So like hanging of my two pieces, I think really added flight to them. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you so much. And then up to you.
on Sundays, especially on Mother's Day, uh, is greatly appreciated. My name is Carson Sears, and today I will be giving my, giving my lecture on my thesis titled, I Am Not an Artist. I am not an artist, but I am a maker. I know that's a very contradictory statement to make, considering you're all sitting here today listening to artist thesis lecture presentations, and I question it myself. For as long as I can remember, I have always had the want and the need to make. It all brings me back to a story from when I was a child between the ages of six and seven. I would go to the shop with my dad. He'd be working on some old rusty vehicle, cleaning it up, trying to make it look brand new to sell. Me, being a little girl, not interested in the work my dad had to do, would wander around the shop, finding scrap pieces of wood. I remember gathering up these pieces in my little hands and drilling holes in them. I would nail them together in an organized fashion and spray paint them, and sometimes I would even burn them. I didn't know why I did this, and today is a little, it is a little clearer. I had the want to make with no rhyme or reason why. Claiming I am not an artist isn't to downplay the artwork that I have done. It is more for a statement to define how I feel about my, about my artwork. There are times where words fall short, and that has seemed to be the case for me over the past years here at Hastings College. Over the past four years, I can remember having critiques about my artwork. I remember trying to come up with some BS story as to why I made the artistic decision that I did. I would leave feeling drained and like a liar and oftentimes feeling stupid. It wasn't until this year that I gained a little bit of confidence into what I really wanted to say. I'm not claiming that my work speaks for itself, but I am saying is that the decisions that I make and the work that I decide to do is purely based off intuition. Because how do you, work, how do you put words to something you can't quite understand yourself? I would like to give credit to our professor, Brian Corp. He was kind enough to share a statement uh, with me earlier this year from his master's paper, and I'd like to share it with all of you. The ideas I address here are founded in my own experience and are a product, and are a product of intuition rather than concrete evidence. Due to the nature of the ideas I am exploring, there are times where language will fall short in the essence of an experience or belief or maybe beyond words. I believe I am compelled to make work in part for this reason with the hope that there will be realms language cannot reach where your experience may begin to. In saying this, I'm not negating my responsibility in this report or suggesting that my work speaks for itself, but rather, at times, I am unable to do so adequately. For this, I am both regretful and grateful. With that being said, um, going into the rest of my presentation, I will not be talking about the my deep personal thoughts or feelings within my work because I am unable to do so at this time. However, I will be talking about my creative process and the ups and downs that came with creating these pieces of work and my artist influences that have driven me both aesthetically and philosophically. Wood and fire are my two primary elements that I use. Using a flame is destructive and oftentimes is daunting, but to me, a flame is beautiful. The way it moves and travels so freely across the plane that is placed upon by my hand is such a meditative process. Each time I came around to burning a piece was a little different from the last. Sometimes it was intentional, and other times it was completely up to the flame where I wanted to travel. During the process, everything phased out around me. I see the fire from the torch hitting the wood, making it black. I hear the sound of the crackling wood, and I feel the heat that propels back towards me while the wood starts to splinter and wither away. During this process, it's a feeling like none other. I feel like the last thing anyone wants to do is quote unquote, destruct a piece of work that they have done. But to me, I'm not disrupting my work. Rather, I'm adding an enhancing element that brings such delicacy and wonder. Elevated, which is defined as situated or placed higher than the surrounding area. My piece elevated was my first large-scale large piece of work that I had ever done. 
I had always tended to work on a smaller scale, one, because of my height, and two, because it could be strenuous. This X-like shape that you see and the height came, this idea came to me while I was driving out to my parents' house. They live up in the mountains, so it was pretty relaxing. I was just thinking about how stressful it's gonna be coming up with a new piece. But um, I was eager to get back to my studio and start working on this piece, not knowing what was going to come about it. After finishing these two separate halves, which were put together by lots of wood glue and a few brad nails, I placed a half inch plank of wood between the two for some extra height. Then came the fun part, which was burning it. During the burning process, I wanted it to be as charred as possible and give this massive piece lots of texture like it deserves through the burning process. My initial plan was to just uh, char the inside corners, which after I had done that, I realized that it needed to be charred completely all the way around. And because I enjoyed doing the process, I wanted to do it over the whole thing. <laughs> um, and then this is elevated. David Nash was an early influence of mine. His work clearly reflects how I decided to do my work. His aesthetic of charring wood past the point that would make most uncomfortable is something that I wanted to push myself. David John Nash is a British sculptor. He has worked worldwide with wood, trees, and natural environment. This is one of his works that I saw um, first, not first yet, one of his first works that I came upon, uh, Black Crack and Shivs, produced in 1999. Um, when I came across this piece, it truly did uh, sing to me a little bit, um, how the wood was completely charred. I knew I wanted to make all of my pieces look that way. It really enhances the texture, especially if you're using natural wood, and I know that's something that I wanted to push uh, throughout all my pieces, even if I wasn't using natural wood, I was just using plywood. Just using plywood. Um, this next piece was the very first one uh, of his that I found. Um, pyramid, sphere, cube. Um, this sculpture was made out of, sing out of a single trunk of oak over 400 years old. These pieces of David Nash's, um, when I saw them at first, I was speechless. I was in complete awe of how they stood there with such a silent rumble to them. These three pieces facing their charcoal shadow had such dominance. It seemed like they were standing their own ground facing themselves. It's absolutely beautiful. After seeing a sculpture like this, I knew I wanted to make statement works within my own pieces. Something that stood, ground, stood its ground and spoke louder than I ever could. In all reality, I wanted to create pieces that spoke for me because I am unable to do so. These three simple shapes and these three simple charcoal drawings that mirror them was the first true piece of artwork I had ever seen that inspired me so much as a maker. Next is self-portrait. Self-portrait is a representation of an artist that is drawn, painted, or photographed, or sculpted by that artist. This piece was created by cutting out square three quarter inch pieces of wood. I used a drill press to create a hole in the center of them. After I was done doing that, um, stacked and glued them all together and then I took a grinder to it and carved it down to the shape and size that I wanted. I went through lots of sandpaper to get it as smooth as possible before burning it. I knew I wanted to get it as smooth as possible because that's something I had control over. Because after the flame is lit inside, I am no longer in control as it sets fire. During this process, I used a smaller um, blowtorch. As you can see in these pictures, the, the flame spirals through the barrel of the wood back and forth and back and forth. After it does this for a while, it starts to break down so much that the flame begins to reach the outside. Once it reaches the outside, I am no longer in control anymore of how it looks. 
because the flame can travel wherever it pleases. After a while, um, to make sure the piece wouldn't burn down, I do have to hose it down, so I do have to put the flame out. Um, the next day, I came back and completely burned it, the outside. Um, something I didn't realize with popper plywood and glue is that it does not smell the best. So after I was done burning it, it was kind of stinking up the whole building, so I went and placed it outside. Um, so it was out of the way of everyone and in a safe environment, but I was definitely wrong. When I came back to check on my piece, I walked outside, turned the corner, and there it was. <laughs> Nothing but a footprint of where it had been. Mm. It had still been charring on the inside, so mix that with some wind and a little heat, and you get a pile of charcoal. <laughs> At first I was discouraged because I had worked so hard to get to the point where it was, and now it was just gone. But then I thought to myself, this is going to make a great story for my presentation today. <laughs> so I did what anyone else would do, and I started over. The same process, again, cutting, grinding, sanding, and then came the burning process. Even though my piece had burned down uh, to the ground before, I was eager to start this process again. I took to using a larger torch called the fluffy torch, which creates a stronger and more constant flame. Uh, during this process, I think this is the most relaxed I had ever been this entire year. Despite of what happened the last go around, uh, watching the flame shoot from one end in and out to the other and seeing the wood start to separate on the inside is so pleasing to watch. And again, like the last one, the flame started to reach the outside. I let it burn. I wanted to see the path where the flame would go and watch it because I was no longer in control. The final product um, is not burnt all the way. This was not based on fear of having it burned down to the ground again, but to me it was a release to not uh, have control over my piece anymore because I did not create the flame. It did it itself. And this is my final piece titled self The next artist influence I'd like to introduce you to um, is Jessica Stockholder. Jessica Stockholder is a Canadian American artist known for site specific installation works and sculptures that are often described as painting in space. She is based in Seattle, Washington and is known for her installation and art sculpture. Installation, art sculpture, painting, drawing, and printing. Jessica Stockholder has um, been an influence on me, not so much aesthetically, but definitely philosophically. She bases her works off of pure intuition. She said in an interview, not knowing what she's making and not knowing what it's about is okay. She thinks that that is the beauty behind art. She was led to believe that her work, because it is intuitive, that she is stupid. I don't think being an intuitive artist is wrong, but oftentimes could be betrayed as you're just making a bunch of work that doesn't mean anything to you or the viewer. But she deems it to be the opposite. She's so in touch with her work and feels connected to it, so connected to it in a way that is indescribable. And that is the beauty of being an artist. And I would like to share a quote of hers with you. Your hands learn to do things you could spend a whole day trying to write about and articulate. There's a discomfort associated with trying to put all those different ways the brain works together. I kind of like to unveil myself in that discomfort. Lucid, defined as, as expressed clearly, clearly and easy to understand. This piece, I definitely drew inspiration from David Nash, um, his work Pyramid, Sphere, and Cube. 
In the past, I have never done a simple shape. I knew I wanted to do so. Little did I know that a square would be so complex. With the help of my professor, Aaron Batum, we took to the drawing board to get all the measurements on how to create a perfect square. I think this is the most math I've done the past four years here at ACS College. <laughs> but the process was rewarding. After getting all the pieces cut down to the right size, I constructed them and put them together. And I was left facing with the perfect box with a two by two void in the middle. Then came the burning process. Because this piece is such a simple shape, when it came to burning it, I didn't want to overdo it, shockingly. Uh, I knew I wanted it to be charred completely black as much as possible, but I didn't want it to start to splinter and wither away um, like my work elevated. Um, when it came to the burning process, this piece, um, I was very intentional with where I placed my flame to make sure I didn't overdo it. I feel like because, it, um, because of the simple shape like a square that is so recognizable, um, that if I were to char it to the extent of the piece elevated, it would take away from the beauty of such a simple shape, which is why I left it as is. Because, um, oh, sorry, I lost my place. There are some places where the flame took over um, and withered away some spots, which is all right to me, um, because underneath those pieces, the wood, where the wood did splinter and fall, you're left with sort of this glossy brown undertone from the layers of the wood, um, which I think gives it a nice contrast. And you can see all the layers of the wood very clearly. Um, my last piece, I only have one picture of. Um, it's titled Flare, which is defined as a sudden brief uh, a sudden brief burst of bright flame or light. This piece is my last one that I am presenting to you today, but it is the first one that I ever did. If it wasn't for this piece that I created at the beginning of the year, I would not be giving a thesis lecture today. This piece made me realize that I am an intuitive artist. It made me realize that I had to let go of the idea of trying to be perfect and just telling everyone what they wanted to hear, rather than saying what I wanted to. When making this piece, I had sketched out a plan and I had an idea um, of what it meant, but I didn't believe a word that I was saying. I just knew that it sounded good to my peers and to my professor when it, came time, when it would come time for a critique. I resorted back to my original process of cutting, stacking, grinding down, sanding smooth. And after I was all complete, I was unsatisfied with how the work had turned out originally, with how the work had turned out. Originally, there was a larger piece on top of this one. And um, I, was, I was just completely unsatisfied with it. Um, I, was so I was so disappointed in myself that the sketch that I came up with, this idea was not what I originally intended. So I took the top piece and I smashed it. Not out of anger, um, but rather I wanted to, as a release, of letting go of the idea that art has to be perfect because really in life, what is? After doing so, I was able to have a conversation with Aaron and I told him exactly how I felt. That I had been BSing everything and that I knew that I wanted to be a maker and work intuitively. Because that um, release that I felt of letting go of the original idea that I had um, drove the rest of the work that I made. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I no longer had to make what I thought everybody else wanted me to. I started making for me. 
In conclusion, this year has been a roller coaster. I have learned so much about myself and the work that I make. I know that I'm meant to think intuitively. I know my hands are meant to build and burn. And I know that my art speaks for me when I cannot. I would like to thank a few people. I would like to thank my dad, who was not able to join us today. If it wasn't for him dragging me to the shop at a young age, I would have never picked up a scrap piece of wood. I would like to thank my mom for always picking up the phone to talk to me about life and the stresses of school and the stresses that came along with this thesis. I would like to thank my peers. It's truly an honor to be in your graduating class and put on a thesis show with you. You are all some of the most talented and best people I've ever met in my life. I would like to thank my professors and definitely a special thanks to Brian Kaur and Aaron Batum. One, for letting me use most of your propane in your sandpaper, um, but two, for really believing in me as an artist. If it wasn't for you guys, I would not be able to stand up here today. Thank you. Get a good feeling when you see the side of a forest car. <laughs> yes. Do you plan on going bigger scale, or do you continue wanting to do the smaller pieces? I think um, definitely bigger scale. I was very satisfied um, creating something that was way taller than me and seeing it and being able to look up at it rather than look down at it. So yes, definitely when I continue to make it in the future, it will be a larger scale. Yes. Sarah, if you were to do it again, what, I guess, rule would you break? Um, I think from viewing your pieces, it's, it makes me feel like I'm doing something illegal and that's really cool feeling. <laughs> uh, just wondered, how could you do more of that? Um, I would think probably using a bigger fire. Yeah. I have like considered like placing a piece of artwork like in an actual fire and just seeing what happens. I mean, it probably would just burn down, but you never know. So definitely a bigger flame if I could get a hold of that. Would be really cool. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about Because it's this empty space that's surrounded by material, but it's so charged. Like, 
Um, in elevated, the large scale one, there is like a half inch void in the middle that separates the two pieces. Um, in placing that there, I didn't realize how much of a question that would bring up and why it was there and what the meaning behind it is. Um, and I honestly don't know what that is yet. <laughs> Truthfully speaking, um, For that one, it was completely intentional, and I knew exactly what size I wanted to be, and I knew exactly how I wanted to, to look, but I did not know why. <laughs> Anyone else? creating a series of images that create an illusion of movement. I just started out growing more about the map and the So I thought about the original software I used when I called Procreate, I only had a limit of 130 frames. The program was more for my data sets, but I switched over to Calipag. Calipag seems pretty unlimited, although it didn't have much variation when it comes to brushes, which is what I like to call create form. But I have a series of three shorts. Each of these are about a few seconds. The first one is called Experimental Works and What's in the Sewers, and the last one is called Morning Routines. I'll discuss each one later, and then I'm going to talk about the characters that appear. The characters that appear are Minerva, Miriam, Crystal, Modestine, Bronco, Beast, Orchid, and Moose. Minerva is the head and owner of her modeling company and does fashion design work. She is also the head model at her modeling agency. Out of all the characters I have made so far, she is the most emotionally stable and intelligent. She is also very elegant, calm, and relatively new. She is a telepath. Minerva's quite wealthy, mostly due to her success from modeling. She's quickly becoming my favorite. Miriam and the weaves the balance of the characters. Miriam, she appears in the first shot of experimental works, and then if you look at her, Miriam is very cocky. Crystal is Minerva's sister and is a right hand man, but is a lot more outgoing than Minerva is and is a lot more flirty. Brian actually described her as seeing trouble. She's very much a femme fatale kind of a character. Modestine is a very pompous kind of person. Modestine isn't really her real name. It's just a name that she thought was better than her own. Her original name was uh, Desdemona. Bronco, she is a private detective. She owns her own detective agency that was bought for only about $10 in USD and then it's currently falling apart. Bronco tends to radiate a cool guy energy. But she is responsible, hardworking, and is very resourceful. She's very good at her job. She's definitely a lot more world weary. Uh, but despite being very responsible, she's not good with finances. That can be a bit of a problem. Rocket can be rational, but at times she can also be crazy. She's quite a quick thinker. She also does fashion design on the side. Her design is more on the 80s fashion that you would see in the 
So the leather jacket is based on this picture here of a 1950s men's jacket, which my two partners, Beast and Murphy, borrowed this jacket for her birthday. Beast is someone who even. Beast has a lot more of the common sense. He is definitely the person that most people are more drawn to. Beast is a lot more friendly. He's very much a realist. He's very grounded. He's also the one that calms down or could a lot during one of her bits. Both he and Bronca tend to look the other way when Orchid's going through her antics. Orchid is the most complicated person to describe. She is like a walking contradiction almost. She can go from spontaneous and wild to just gazing out the window and melancholy. She can go from drinking turpentine for fun to <laughs> drunk driving to reciting the great works of William Shakespeare from their way. She is ironically also the most responsible for finances. We are also a bit of a pyromaniac. Everywhere she goes, she sets dumpsters on fire. She is also the type of person, if she likes you, she's almost like a dog. Very loyal, follow you around, annoy you, and will show you affection, platonically or romantically. And it's pretty open. If she doesn't know you, she'll still treat you like you're a part of the group, but also distance herself from if she doesn't like you, she will do everything in their power to destroy all your hopes and dreams. I based her style around the styles of characters like Harley Quinn, Cross Hargreaves, and Larry from Weekend at Bernie's. It could be described as loud, some would describe it trash. It usually comprises of strange bright colors. They are also like a pretty good engineer. They actually build cars, motorcycles, and airplanes in their spare time. However, they are a terrible carpenter. She is actually the one who built the table in morning routines. She can also throw very violent tantrums from anger or frustration. Next up is Liz. Liz is like the stereotypical 2000s girls from the hills. Her look is mostly inspired from the bubblegum pink aesthetic and a what's his style from Legally Blonde. She used to be a bit of a tomboy in her younger years. Liz speaks in a tone and lingo that I will hate with every fiber of my being. She does do like the stereotypical things like shopping. She still has some of her old tough guy energy. If you're also wondering why she has much more orange tinted skin, it's mostly due to the fact that she likes using spray tans. The world that the characters live in is a very vast, open world that is ever-expanding with different cultures and from different time periods. Going through the history will probably take 30 minutes of it, so with different cities, with different names, and different languages. Even languages that have been long since dead, but the characters that I mentioned before live in is primarily based from the 80s to the early 2000s. There are accounts that are steampunked or diesel pumped or atom pumped. Some of them can be civilizations with modern technology. I grew up watching either Disney, Cartoon Network, or Nickelodeon. Each one is different in how they can express ideas and stories. There's also different ways how can be visually style and how characters can form expression. My three shorts, first one is called Experimental Works. It introduces the characters Miriam, Minerva, Crystal, and Montestine. This is mostly small snippets of stories and I was trying out different camera angles and movements. I'm trying to simulate a flash cut, like the zoom cut that you can see in some cartoons, where the camera moves very fast. And also trying to do more of the motions of personality, mostly in like Crystal and Modestine. The second one, What's in the Sewers, stars Franca, who is investigating the sewers. The reason is due to a series of disturbances in a part of town that was under construction. It was also my first time doing a full character walking cycle, along with doing more like difficult turns and also doing more with lighting. The last one was probably my most 
the Manic one, this one took a lot longer to finish, but I'm pretty happy with the final product. This one is in more of the domestic side of things, like waking up and just checking the paper, getting your makeup ready, doing your hair. So far for this school year, I've been teaching myself how to do walk cycles, how to do arm movements, and make you know, my food as they need to be. Oh, my God, I have to walk more, walk through the dialogue. We're like trying to do simple physics, like hair movement, clothing, which I mostly got out of the animation textbook. I learned how to do all that while looking at the figures and drawing them for practice. And then there was a the whole process of going frame by frame, making sure at least the majority of the even few seconds I have mashed up mostly, along with coloring and details, and making sure that my extra details there. I guess my main influences would be cartoons and movies and growing up with like Nicktoons and Cartoon Network and Disney and seeing all the different ways that storytelling and all the different styles that different creators use and like the different techniques that different creators have, especially in different like time periods, like the quality of animation during the 30s and 40s by Disney and Tex Avery or the quality in Tom and Jerry to the limited style of Hanna Barbera or to the Renaissance of the 80s and just to the, like the cartoons that we have to this day it's just so fascinating to see. Animation is uh, a medium that doesn't get a whole lot of like acknowledgement but it can still be enjoyed by millions and millions of people. There are also different ways that creators learn from uh, live action movies as well with like camera angles and movement. Especially if you look at like hand drawn films like Akira and how they portray lighting and fluid movement always just like an ink and pen. And I hope to one day get to that level of quality. Thank you for listening to my lecture.